So thanks everybody. Um, I'm Leah Kistner. Uh, I'm the Chief Privacy Officer of a startup called Humu. And we take very strongly peer-reviewed people science, a bunch of data analysis, and a little bit of love to try and help people be happier and more productive at work, to make work better. Before that, I was the Global Lead of Privacy Technology at Google. Um, I was there for almost 12 years. And my longtime collaborator uh, worked on some of this with me, a guy named Jonathan Zunger. He was at Google for ever, but he's at Google now too. So, why am I here? I'm here because of failure. I'm here because I have seen too many things fail. We've all seen too many things fail. And I've seen too many things fail because of bugs. I've seen too many things fail though because they were designed badly in the first place. And I've seen them fail for people and have really strong impacts on people. So more specifically, I'm here because I have a framework on how to help teams that are building products build those products with respect. Now, this is something that's tested, something that uh, I've been developing over about the last seven years, and it's practical in the face of edges. And why do I care about edges? Well, the world is basically made of edges at this point. Systems are so large that things that we had previously considered edge cases just aren't. For example, uh, back in the day, people didn't assume that every time that they ran a computation, it was equivalent to taking several computers and beating them up with head sledgehammers right in the middle of your computation. These days, we assume that that's what happens. But even more than that, there are so many humans, and there are so many different kinds of humans, and they're interacting ways that are changing all the time. The, a former team member of mine, Andy Scow, said something really useful, which is, if something happens to one in a million users once a year, at Google, that is best expressed as six times a day. And Google's not exactly the only company out there, right? Edge cases aren't. We have to plan for this. So today I'm going to talk about a few things. Why we want to build with, with for trust and build with respect. Uh, this framework for building with respect, and then some ways that I think that we can collaborate better between industry and academia, and with public policy and regulation. So starting with this, why is our goal to build, build for trust? We need trust for people to be willing to engage with us, to believe in our reliability, to believe that we speak the truth, and to believe that we act with respect. And I think Wikipedia puts it best, that respect is a positive feeling or action shown towards someone or something considered important or held in high esteem or regard. And it's also this process of honoring someone by exhibiting care, concern, or consideration for their needs or feelings. That is what I want to build in technology. This is what we need in technology. I still get asked, why, why should we build with trust? This is, this is a squishy human concept, and it's very hard to measure. And how, how should this be the thing I care about? And to explain a little bit about that, I want to go back to a faraway land called the 1970s, when there was this cartel called OPEC. And they got together, and they decided to raise the price of oil really dramatically. And that meant the gas guzzlers that people were building in Detroit at the time became not so attractive. And into the breach stepped a company with a new car, and this car became famous. It didn't become famous for the reason most cars become famous. No, no, no. This car became famous because of accountants. Because this car had a problem. If you had even a small rear end collision, the gas tank could rupture, spraying gas all over the inside of the car, resulting in this. And the accountants decided that it was cheaper to pay off everyone who experienced this rather than to fix the gas tank. So I want to ask you, 
do you want to buy a Ford Pinto? That car made Ford the laughing stock of the world. It made the Pinto a, the butt of jokes for literally decades. It made Ford known for doing things that were really horrible for money. And it didn't pay off money-wise either. Uh, after a few leaked memos, some regulatory inquiry, and a lot of very large lawsuits, they had to recall all of the cars, and they lost a huge amount of money. But here's the thing that people don't tell when they tell the Pinto story. The Pinto was actually about average for subcompact car safety. But that didn't matter. It did not matter because people didn't trust Ford anymore. That was, that was a real problem for their company. And the fires that we see today in the news aren't about cars, but they're about security, they're about privacy, they're about respect. And those are every bit as much existential risks for the companies that, that face them as the Pinto was for Ford. So if we want to build a trust, build for trust, we can't force people to trust us. All we can do is invite trust by building with respect. So this is a framework around building with respect. Now there are a lot of pieces in here, uh, things like really good solid infrastructure, incident response, postmortems, lots and lots of things in there. But what I'm going to talk about today is what I see as the heart of this, which is building products with respect at their core. So if you are an expert working in this area who's working with teams, you need to start off by remembering that product teams want to build a great product. They really do. I've gotten a little bit of skepticism about this, especially in regulatory circles, but it's true. People want to build great things. So you start off by helping them to understand that if you want to build a great product, it must be a respectful product. There are no other options there. The second thing you need to remember is that no one is an expert in everything, especially when we're talking about fields like security and privacy and respect that move so incredibly fast. People are not able to keep up with all of the developments here and actually do their day job of writing code or building designs or whatever. So the way I handle this is what I call here there be dragons. So there's all this map over here and, and, and lots of things where people know the lay of the land. You've built really solid infrastructure. You know how to, to solve these problems. You know how to handle this data. But then, then we're going to start touching things that are really sensitive. We're going to start going into problems that we really just don't know the answers to. And at that point, you're going to need to ask for some help. If you're going to walk out into the part of the map where there are dragons, that's where you ask for help. And ideally, you're going to start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. Um, this is because the decisions that you make at the inception of the system are going to inform how that system develops and be very difficult to change. One of the things that I didn't understand, so like my PhD is in crypto, right? I hadn't built any big software systems before I went to Google is that when you put code out there in the world, even if you put it on a platform that can do updates like Android or iOS or people's desktop machines, I swear that code lives forever. If you go and ask for people's consent in a particular way in that, in that binary, somebody's got it forever. If that code is sending you particular kinds of data, somebody's got it forever, and you're not going to be able to update it for everybody. Also, things like identity systems, like even if one user can never see another in the system, assumptions that you make about a user's identity get built into the data schema and all sorts of other pieces of your system. Once users can see each other, then you have things about visibility models and interaction models. And anonymity and all sorts of other things that are very hard to change in the system because effectively you have to get everybody to agree to change them. It's hard. But if you can't start at the beginning, don't despair. Everything in this talk is still applicable, but your life is probably a little bit harder. So here are the steps for this. The first one is we need to find all of the parts. It sounds obvious it's hard. Than you think. Uh, the second one is to check the invariance, the promises that you have made to your 
users, your regulators, your contracts, and to yourself. And then at this point, we start getting into kind of the deeper things. We need to do threat modeling. We need to look at the, at the targets, the attackers, and the failure modes of the system. And then we need to triage and correct the issues that we found, and then document, document, document. So starting off with finding all the parts. Turns out if you go to an engineer and you tell them, hey, can you tell me about your system? Where are all the parts? What they will tend to tell you is, well, here's my front end, and it, and it talks to the users, and I have, oh, I have this other one over here, and it talks to the users, and, and here's my storage. And they may not tell you, oh, there's an anti-abuse system over there, and all my data goes over there to do its ML magic. And, oh, um, oh right, I have an ML pipeline, and there's probably some intermediate results in, in that pipeline. Oh, oh, logging, I have logging. And, and the whole analytics system on top of that, and probably 17 other things. Even in a relatively small system, there are a lot of parts, and unless you find all of them, you can't make sure that your variants apply, and you can't make sure your system is being respectful. So next we're gonna check the invariants. So invariants are the baseline promises that you have made to yourself and to others. A lot of those are driven by regulations or contracts. Uh, so for example, hey, data needs to go away from all of your systems within n days of a particular event, a contract termination, uh, somebody deleting their account, somebody deleting a particular piece of data, or the data being written in the first place. Also, these are promises that you've made to your users. So for example, I worked on a system a while ago which could track users across pretty much the entire internet. And we decided that we didn't want to do that. And we decided that was a bad idea, so we went and we told the press, and we put it on a web page, and we said, we will not do this. And that became one of our invariants. But there were a lot more invariants that we had. We made promises to ourselves to protect our users. Some, in some ways, they were too technical often for them to really understand, but were rules that we put in place and we kept in order to protect affected parties. The reason why we start by checking invariants is that this tends to be faster than the more in-depth analysis work, partially because we've written down what all the invariants are, or if you haven't, they're not going to stay invariant very long. So, and because if the invariants aren't satisfied, you're going to have to change your system anyways, and so don't do the more in-depth analysis work before your system is settled out a little bit. So next, we move into the more in-depth place modeling the threats. Starting with ta targets, moving to attackers, and then looking at how the system fails before mashing all these things up into a whole nightmare fuel filled analysis session. So let's look at targets. The first thing you need to do is identify all the groups affected, both directly and indirectly. Now, the directly affected groups tend to be fairly simple because they're actually talking to you, but Everybody else is a little more complicated. So say you want a photo service. Some people aren't giving you photos, and they're saying, please post these photos for me. But what if you have photos of people? The people who are in those photos, even though you don't know who they are, they can be affected. Or Equifax has given us a sad and wonderful example of affected parties who are not communicating directly with the system. You didn't have to know who Equifax was to be affected by their breach. And then you need to consider the vulnerabilities of those groups. Consider how their different life circumstances interact with, uh, with these groups in order to make them particularly vulnerable in some places. Fair warning, you're gonna miss something. There are too many humans in the world, there are too many groups of humans in the world, they interact in ways that are changing too quickly in order to understand the power structures involved in how all these people interact. There are a couple things that help. Uh, having a diverse team helps. The team I built at Google uh, was, was very diverse for this reason. Other reasons too, but, um, but partly for this reason. There were about half women non-binary folks, at least 20% black and Latinx, uh, very strong LGBT plus representation, people born on every continent except for Antarctica, uh, people who come from a lot of different communities and, and have a lot of different professional backgrounds. Uh, somebody who's an ex-journalist, ex, -journalist, ex 
ex-social worker, ex-librarian, people with all the PhDs you could expect as well, but this made us much better at our jobs. User research also helps a ton because you're never gonna have somebody who is simultaneously unemployed and employed in your team. So you're never gonna cover everything. I have, I have more nefarious plans to try and fix that longer term, but I'm gonna get to that later in the talk. So then we look at these kind of vulnerability factors. So for example, you might wanna look at, at invisible minorities. Is there a fundamental property of somebody that if exposed could make them particularly vulnerable? So for example, are they LGBT plus? Uh, in certain areas of the world, they, people can be targeted for this. Are people of particular religious background? Uh, whatever religious background it is, somewhere in the world, somebody is going to get targeted for that. Uh, how about disability? Is somebody have limited vision, limited hearing, limited fine motor control? Are they housebound and rely on their application or can provide to perform the daily activities of life? What if somebody is experiencing poverty? Can they, can they interact successfully with their system? Uh, what if they can afford to adapt, interact with their system, but it will pose significant financial hardship for them? What if somebody is experiencing abuse? What if they have, are in an intimate partner abuse relationship? What if they have just escaped from such a relationship? What if they have a stalker? Uh, this one in particular, ten, people tend to assume that this is not particularly common, but just in the US, uh, for women, that is something about one in four women over the course of their lifetime uh, will experience severe intimate partner violence. Uh, for men, the figure is about one in nine. I don't have figures for non-binary folks, but given the very high rates of violence against the trans community, it's probably very high. You don't know who are in any of these states, and you, so you have to build your system assuming that some of your users are there. What if a person has a secret? And here's the thing. Everybody either has a secret or they can get a secret without meaning to. I live my life in a pretty open way, and I started having a miscarriage. I did not want to have that conversation with anybody at work, right? I didn't have a secret the day before, and I said, without one. So now we look at factors of the attacker. Maybe they have a commercial objective. They want to sell something to you. They might have a criminal objective to steal something, commit fraud or another crime. They might have a political objective. Maybe they want to change the world. A malicious objective. They might just want to hurt somebody. They might just want chaos. And I promise you, this is not a joke. If you do not plan for the chaos monkeys, they will plan for you. And there are some bonus features for attackers. These, by the way, are not comprehensive lists. These are the ones that I, I, I'm trying to write down more and more of these, but this is kind of a sample list. Uh, advanced attackers have access to, to resources that are not available to all your attackers. They might have their own intelligence service. They might have their own police force. What if they're insider attackers? They have privileged access to the inside of your system, for example, because they are an employee. What if they are intimate attackers and have access to somebody's lives? Uh, for example, if they are an untrustworthy partner or an untrustworthy roommate, which is something which is status quo for many people throughout their lives. Uh, what if somebody, a power figure, for example, an employer or a religious figure in that person's life, they may have access to more information and they may have levers of power on somebody. A persistent attacker is one who will keep going long after everybody else will have picked up. And there's, there's a, there is a theme to this. So much of how humans interact with each other has to do with institutionalized power structures. And if we don't build products that understand and plan for this, our products are not going to serve people appropriately. Now for every system, there are certain uh, particular types of attackers uh, that you're going to get by matching up all of those, all of those factors before that are particularly relevant in your system. So for example, you might need to worry about a government who is trying to suppress uh, political dissonance in an untargeted way. So for example, Turkey a couple of years ago decided that they wanted to crack down on dissidents. And so they were going to do that by arresting everybody who had a particular messaging application on their phone. Now that messaging application was used by many dissidents, but it was used by other people too. And honestly, they just didn't really care. So they just crowded everybody up. 
And that's a really different threat model than a government that's trying to suppress dissidents in a really targeted way, where they're going after one particular person. So then, we look at the, how things fail in the system. So this is pretty much like any system design review. You look at how, you know, like how, do you, how does control move throughout the system? How does data move throughout the system? How does the system fail? What if this fails? What if this fails? What if they both fail? But on top of that, you want to look at some kind of particularly tricky areas of the system for respect. So for example, um, anything where a user can share information with another user tends to be uh, High friction area, we're checking. Authentication. If somebody is unauthenticated, do they have an appropriate amount of information about them and their place in the system? You have to balance that with the fact that they're unauthenticated. You don't know who they are. You don't know that there's the same person who sent you data before. Um, authentication system, what if it fails? So what if a hacker gets in there and hijacks somebody's account and takes irreversible actions? Um, is that okay? And I'm not saying things like don't have the delete button because an attacker might take over somebody's account. But I'm saying you need to consider this because, for example, you might want to say, well, uh, you can't turn over your account to somebody else without a waiting period or without further confirmation. Automated decision making is a really important place to look. Anything from a recommendation system into an autopilot can have really unfortunate uh, failure modes. Look at your false positives, look at your false negatives, and look at the impacts of those things. But you also need to look at what happens when your, when your automated decision making is correct. So for example, a number of years ago, Target accidentally alerted a parent that their teenage daughter was pregnant. Facebook keeps having to go in and, and say over and over again, I swear, I swear, I, we are not using your microphone to listen to you in Target ads. Now, the output of both of those technical systems was correct, but it was a very bad product decision for everybody involved, right? You can't rely on correctness for respect, necessarily. Oh, anti-view systems are really good. You have to look at what happens when somebody, when your anti-view system fails, especially when an attacker tries to use your anti-view system. What if your attacker goes and says, well, my target is sending spam or harassment or copyright infringement or child sexual abuse imagery. What happens when somebody tries to, to use your anti-abuse system to abuse someone else? System turned down. Your system probably won't, won't live forever. What are you gonna do when you turn it down? Are you gonna lose somebody's baby pictures? How do you avoid that? So once you have all of those kind of terrible things that might happen, you get to match them up and see how they work together. This is where things get really uh, exciting. So you want to look at things like, hey, what if my system is used as intended? What happens by some? Uh, what happens if it's used as intended by somebody who lives or works next to somebody in a particular group? What if it's used by somebody well-meaning and misguided? So, for example, some HR person at a company decides it's a really good idea to make the company happier by firing all the unhappy people, right? They have, you know, good intention, really bad execution. What if your system's being used by an attacker, both as designed and they're often kind of brittle places in any system, what if they can exploit one of those? What if your system is used by basically everyone in the world, except for your group? What does that mean? What does that mean for them? What if they try to use it later, uh, but are they going to have a reasonable experience? Uh, one example of this is things like email systems have a first come, first serve identity model. So if I join an email system later, can I get a professional looking email address? Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe that's okay, I don't know. But I'm, I'm not saying judge whether it's good or bad or not, just look at all the effects. Uh, social and financial pressures, what if somebody doesn't have the money to interact with something or it's going to change their life in a significant way. Feelings. Because it turns out that humans have feelings as much as sometimes engineers like to deny this. What if somebody is uh, going to feel creeped up by a system? 
What if somebody is uh, experiencing suicidal ideation and they have an uncomfortable resonance with trending topics on the social network? What if they have an exercise anorexia? Right? We need to remember that not everybody experiences every situation the same. If somebody sent me a whole bunch of articles about running better, I would be really happy. If somebody sent somebody with exercise anorexia, those, those same articles, that could cause a, a lot of problems for them. So now once we've constructed our nightmare fuel, at that point, we can triage and try and correct the issues. I'm not gonna go into a ton of depth on this because honestly, this is, this is a several day topic. Uh, but the idea here is that we want to build consensus around respectful decisions. We want to weigh the trade-offs around each of these scenarios we're talking about. What's the probability of the scenario of happening? What is the degree of impact on the affected party? And what is the ability of the affected party to avoid bad outcomes? Now, I'm not saying that it is the responsibility of the affected party to to avoid bad decisions or bad situations in every case. But what I am saying is that I am not omniscient. I don't know what everybody in the world wants. Honestly, if I knew what everybody in the world wants, that would be deeply, deeply creepy, and I don't think anybody would be happy with that either. So I, you need to build a ways to ask meaningful questions, but a limited number of them. The hardest part about this is that many problems simply don't have correct answers. Privacy and security are not the only benefits in play for humans. There are other things in this world, and they're, they are also important. And most, while most issues can be corrected with some tweaking to a system, some have really fundamental trade-offs with other goals. And different perspectives lead to non-parallel metrics. So in a world where we just have activists and system operators, an activist will tend to look at you, all users and systems in the context of the particular problem that they're concerned about. And a system operator will tend to look at all, uh, all users and problems in the context of their system. And that leads them to evaluate systems in really different ways because a problem, a system can, can be, have a really big impact on a problem without that problem having, having a very big impact on the system. Like, I think the Pinto would have been different outcome-wise if the people who were in Ford were not stuck in this system operator mode. It's, and a lot of the work that we do in this space is about making sure that, that we are avoiding these people uh, thinking past each other in different ways. And we also need to, to understand that if we choose to avoid risk, that choice is not free. If we don't do anything, then, no, then nothing gets done. And that means nothing good gets done as well as nothing bad gets done. We won't build a system that allows my children to talk to their sick grandparents in another country. We won't build systems that allow us to have access to the art and culture and knowledge that would otherwise be locked in libraries that I might never be able to get to and you might never be able to get to halfway around the world. And also, many fewer cute cat pictures. That, that was always important. So when we're doing triage and correction, our goal is respectful, well-reasoned decisions in a reasonable amount of time. Lastly, we need to document, document, document. Systems that change, dependencies change, and teams change. And so if you don't write down your invariants and check them, your invariants will not remain invariant for very long. They, they just won't. And so you need to write things down to save yourself the bleary-eyed code archaeology that you are going to be performing at 3 a.m. Okay, so now after you do all of this stuff, now you have a design, and it's beautiful, and it's lovely, and it's respectful, and everybody is really happy, and then I'm going to make you really sad because I can point out that this does not matter. Policies don't matter. Designs don't matter. Unless 
they actually have some relationship to how you show up in the world for people. That's what people actually care about. They don't care about your intentions. They care about the effects. So what you need is some assurance that your intentions have something to do with your actual system. So ideally, you would have automated assurance. Uh, your best choice is to make certain kinds of failures logically impossible. If you can't do that, you want to make them practically impossible. And so the difference between that is whether a system just literally cannot do that thing at all, when that, that failure mode has nothing to do with the system. And that's different than, so for example, when I showed up at Fumu, one of the things I did was I started writing a bunch of assurance checks into our data pipeline so that if somebody made a bug in the anonymization code, now the, now the uh, anonymization uh, checker will just make the entire pipeline fail and just be like, nope, no data for you, go fix your anonymization code first. If you can't get that, you want to monitor for failures and then fix them. The reason why this isn't as good is that it is very easy to, to end up in a place where your signal to noise ratio is not super awesome, and you are going and having to tell people, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, over and over and over and over again, and A, they hate you now, and B, the system has never reached a state at which it is really working well. Turns out computers can't do everything though, so you need human assurance in a lot of cases. Humans need to evaluate things with human semantic value. So for example, you might need to audit your load-bearing code. Uh, load-bearing code is those small pieces of code, or at least they better be small and well-contained, otherwise you'll have other problems, that handle things that are crucial to the respectful operation of the system, your authentication system, your authorization system, uh, things like that. Decision support. When humans make decisions, they need to have the right information in the right place at the right time. This is one of the reasons why data management and usage is so incredibly hard in large systems, because you're likely to say, would you like to put this person in this group? And the person who is charged with making that decision will be like, what does the group do? I don't know. And they have to go try and figure this out. But in general, humans need the right information in the right place at the right time. As much as I am an engineer and process is not my go-to, process is really important. Humans have this tendency to be forgetful or procrastinate on, for example, doing all of the ISO audit stuff that I spent last week doing. Right? It wasn't my favorite thing to do, but it was important to do it, so we got to schedule. And one of the most underrated kinds of human assurance is user experience research. I don't know very well what everybody in the world is going to think about a particular interface if I look at it. If I can go and ask a bunch of people, I am much more likely to have a good answer for that. And now you have to do all of this again for every single change. No problem, right? So as you, as you grow as you're into the system, you tend not to have to do every single thing for every single change. But if you don't consider every single change, your system is going to drift startlingly quickly, and, you're, and you won't have a respectful system anymore. OK, so now I have some suggestions. Um, collaboration, maybe we can do that in So you might have looked at that talk and said to yourself, self, there are so many open questions here. And I agree. There are so many open questions here. I intend this framework to be the start of a community resource. Uh, a number of large tech companies, which I'm not going to name because I have not coordinated with their PAR departments yet, uh, have said that they are that this is what they that they are very interested in this and they want to do this together. I would love for other people to add to it. If there are things that that, that those of us in industry should be looking for both human failures as well as system failures, or even better, ways to avoid system failures, that would be really amazing. Help those of us in industry who ask these questions every single day. Because practitioners cannot do this alone. We, we need more breadth of perspective. And industry is asking for this. This is stuff that we really need.
since this, is, uh, since this is intended to be a community resource, that means we should have it maintained by the community. If anybody wants to be part of the curation community, please let me know. And then let's talk about a little bit about public policy and, and regulation, which I actually have. I can now talk about because I don't have a publication review. I know so people, ask, people ask me about this stuff for years, and I couldn't say it before. So, a lot of some of the things I think about um, that, some of the things I think about about regulation of space is, is, is the privacy regulation is somewhat like the fire code. It is one of those things where it's really important to do it right, but the regulators probably don't know all of the details. And that's even more true in privacy than it is in the fire code where you really don't want the, reg the, the legislatures trying to pick out which kinds of insulation I can use in my garage. Privacy moves a lot faster than insulation. So I think that, that regulation is most effective when it works with practitioners to make costs clear up front to make sure that costs that might otherwise be externalized are internalized and they are very apparent right up front. It's very hard to measure security and privacy and respect. It's really difficult. It is much easier to register, uh, to talk about monetary costs and, uh, and lost opportunities. Everything we can do to avoid perversity in metrics and make let the practitioners bring up those bring those trade-offs up in a concrete way up front makes it easier for us. This is a particularly important because business leaders notoriously don't serve uh, the kind of communities that, that they are members of, right? They may lack intuition for these problems because they are not members of certain kinds of communities. Same thing is a request to not anticipate the research, or at least not anticipate the research too much. Compliance for regulations relies on turning the, the regulation into a big old ch bunch of checklists, ideally asking minimally ambiguous questions. Even if you don't know what a good answer looks like in the space, compliance is going to go and turn the thing into a list of checklists, good questions in the checklist and everything like that. That checklist, however, may, may or may not result in anybody doing any kind of useful work whatsoever unless you consider filling out paperwork really useful work. And the problem is that in this space, an awful lot of it is stuff that we do not know what good answers for yet. And I'm really worried that if we do too much regulation in this space without being that in that close collaboration with the research community, what we're going to get is ossification around what is easy instead of rather continued searching after what is a good answer. I just want to choose regulation carefully because otherwise only the big players can effectively comply. So Google spent a lot of money. GDPR. So I was I was effectively a tech lead of GDPR for Google. It, I personally spent hundreds of hours on this, and I don't come super cheap, right? Like that's on top of the, the rest of the privacy team and people across the company. Here's the thing: Google already had a privacy program. Google had already had infrastructure to go and do data deletion. Google already had Google Takeout. Google was in way, way ahead of, of most companies. At a startup, even a startup like Humu, where we are extremely overweighted in terms of security and privacy expertise, when we're doing these things, we still have almost as much paperwork as Google has to do, but there are many, many, many fewer of us to do it. And I'm, it is not optional for companies to do the right thing. They need, we need to make sure we are weighing risk according to risk to the users, not according to size of the company. But I want to make sure that we're regulating in concert with systemization so that we can tell them what good answers look like, as opposed to having a bunch of companies that definitely don't have privacy engineers 
probably don't even have security engineers, having them guess. And part of that is because I want to see all of the ideas that people have in store. Like, we're just getting to the point where VCs are funding startup founders from many, many more backgrounds, and they have really interesting ideas. I don't only want to see whatever sort of ideas that the big tech companies have in store for us. I want to see a much bigger, bigger variety than that. I want to account for human diversity. In privacy, if somebody tells you that there is one right answer to something, they are almost always going to be wrong. So, for example, like I hate to I hate to pick on privacy by design, but like privacy by design is a really big thing in the in this space where people are like, oh, design privacy in the things. I'm like, yes, design privacy in the things. But one of the tenets of that is that in all cases, you must choose the most protective option as the default for a setting. I look at that and I say, what is the most protective option, right? In a world where we have Fancy Bear literally spear phishing politicians and put, pasting their stuff all over the internet in an effort to sway elections and sow chaos, what is the most protective option? Is it the most protective option to scan people's email for, for phishing and malware? Or is it more protective not to do that data processing? I, I'm not saying I know the answer. I literally don't know the answer to this question. And there are a lot more questions just like this. If you are asking meaningful questions of your users, you do not know the answer, and that answer will probably differ by person. I also want to let the profession learn. Right now, people will not talk about near misses, they will not talk about vulnerabilities, and they will definitely not talk about the root causes of incidents, because companies are terrified of being sued. They are absolutely terrified. And I've seen people speculate, but lack real data. I've, I've worked, I have worked to that incident at Google, right? Um, this could be Wi-Fi incident, for example. I, I ran that incident, I wrote a bunch of things. And I've seen a bunch of people speculate about what caused an incident and be so totally wrong. And they didn't have data, right? I don't think they were, I don't think they were trying to, to, to say something wrong. They just didn't really have data. So there are big companies that may have enough privacy engineering chops and they may have a diverse enough and large enough set of systems to see how these systems really do fail in practice and learn how to make them not fail. But what I'm worried about is academia does not have access to this. Civil society does not have access to this. Small companies do not have access to this. And I want to live in a world where we have a lot fewer incidents. And the incidents that we have are smaller severity. But I think to get there, we are going to have to talk about what works and what doesn't work, and importantly, why doesn't it work. And right now, we're not in a space where that's going to happen. We need, we need space for that conversation. So that's it. So I think we should build for trust, because you know what? We don't all have to learn these lessons the hard way. Thank you. So please feel free to shout questions, and please repeat them so we have picked up on the microphone. So, given the edginess of the problems, is there a way, like, how does a company or somebody that's producing something uh, reason about their responsibility? I mean, clearly, we've talked a little bit in the previous session, but uh, in here, you know, clearly there's, it's not always clear. So, how do you, is there a way to include that into the model at all, or some, some guidelines, or? So, uh, the question is, in a world filled with edges, how should companies reason about what their responsibilities are? And let me see if I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly. I think that companies should be responsible for, uh, for following best practices, right? We need to build the best practices, but they need to be responsible for saying, like, 
I don't want somebody to say like, oh, I forgot that political dissidents exist. I forgot that trans people exist. I forgot that that you know people experiencing poverty or homelessness exist. I don't. I don't think that that is a good excuse. I also don't think that it is necessary for every product to serve every community. It's not effectively possible, but there are ways of evaluating whether it's going to work well, because you can, you can look at things like, if I, if, if, I put up a, if I put up a product, are people sorting themselves appropriately into people using, using a particular product or feature and people who are not? Uh, and that's actually not the way that people tend to measure experiments in industry. They will tend to look at things like, I have a, I have a particular choice. What is the opt-in rate? And I think that's a, that is precisely the wrong metric to use. I think what you need to use is, are people sorting themselves appropriately into these buckets? Um, I, th I think that that those feel like things that, that, that people should be responsible for. So as a follow-up, do you see it? So it sounds like like there are. I've seen some recurring patterns in bakery. There's clearly certain groups of people that, in general, need, need kind of a first class assessment relative to any product. Does it make sense, or did, would you feel confident in saying, "Hey, we should codify some of this in a in a, in a document"? Um, or what? Well, yes. The uh, question is, <laughs> I see some recurring patterns in, in the things that you're talking about. Should we codify this in a document? Why, yes. Yes, we should. Uh, also, the, what I'm planning to do is put up a website because as, as much as I can just write a document, there's a couple things. One of them is I am painfully aware that I am not omniscient. And, and for two reasons. One of them is I'm just not omniscient and other people should be contributing to this as well. Uh, people know lots of things I don't. The other one is that people change and how people interact with each other changes and how systems work and how systems break changes. And so I would like to keep this as live as possible so that we can so that we, we can say, okay, well, you know, we, there's a new revision of the system. By the way, have you considered have, have you considered how people are using using disinformation to, move, to cause genocides in these places, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you have a solution. And I'm not saying that all of these things are anticipatable or fixable, but you can, you should be considering all of the things on this list. Does that make sense? So uh, Nancy Levison has written a lot about past disasters, things like the Thurac 25 radiation machine killing people, that sort of thing. And we can then learn from prior disasters. How can we learn from all these things that we are still covered by NDAs, both at your former employer and elsewhere? How can we get the knowledge out? So the question is, how can we learn from disasters that people uh, have seen in industry but are covered by NDAs so we can't talk about them? Dan asks after having spent breakfast trying to pick my brain about one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so this 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 is the reason why I've been going around and saying like, can we find a way to have these conversations? So there are probably some places who are not going to be willing under any circumstances to talk about bad things that happen. There are definitely other ones, other places that care very deeply about making sure that we can share information and learn from it and maybe not repeat these mistakes or even better, figure out the patterns of mistakes before they happen. Um, we have definitely found serious, serious issues quite a lot before they happen by observing these patterns uh, in the past. I think it's going to have to be some kind of regulatory safe harbor for this. As much as people hate doing regulatory safe harbors, being able to do to put people in a room and be able to maybe report on kind of things that happen in the room without attribution might be a way it might be a way that we can do that. But that's something that we're not I don't think we're gonna be able to do except for a concert with regulators. And that means that they need to be on board with like let's 
let's do this plan to make fewer incidents happen. I mean, if I had a regulate, an incident wish list for regulators too, by the way, the EU regulators are getting so much data about, about bridges uh, right now. I really, really wish that we could go and make that data come in in a way that's a little more structured because I think what's coming in right now is a lawyer wrote a document, um, which is not super awesome from a technical or cause analysis point of view. And but I would love to get that a little more structured and then put my fingers in there and do a lot of analysis because this is our first chance to really look at, hey, what are people really seeing in practice? Because I've seen, I've seen what Google has problems with, but it doesn't mean that I've seen what um, manufacturing plants have had problems with or lots and lots of other different kinds of industries. Okay, so that's Any other questions? No one's gonna ask. Um, so, so I thought a lot about security and you know, obviously we can teach a security class. Okay, here's a buffer overflow, here's how to break a bunch of junk, um, which is minimally effective. Do you have any ideas how Rice and the CS department could think about this notion of building for trust? And does it make sense is there any way to kind of start to build? Because it seems like one of the things here is to actually train your everyday engineers, so that they actually kind of think about this without without uh, you know, without being probed for them. Is it possible to integrate this, or how could somebody like Rice think about integrating this into their career? So, how could somebody like Rice think about integrating this notion of building for trust and building for respect into their curriculum? Uh, I do think it's totally possible. There are uh, people who are better at the converse of this, just like every discipline. But uh, one of the things that I did at Google was uh, I was running the largest privacy engineering training program in the world. And if that sounds weird, it is totally weird. The only other one is, is CMU's master program for privacy engineers. But that means that we have trained more privacy engineers than literally everyone. And a lot of those were people who don't have expertise in the field. And we found that there were actually pretty limited amounts of training where we, where we teach people to kind of ask the question, you know, how does this fail? How does this matter for people? And ask that question and ask that question and ask that question. And once people get in the habit of asking that question, they became so much better at not and building things that just worked better in the first place. And that worked better on a couple of different levels. Like, it was a better product. Um, we've had people come to us and just be like, I build better products now. But uh, they also tend to build and design better systems because they think about the failure modes a little bit more up front. And they think about the failure modes that matter. Right? Most people would not have thought about things like, how do you build a system so that it is explainable to a human? And when you start saying things like, what happens when I throw this mess up on the screen and somebody is like, I don't even know, right? So people, so we see people building systems that way. Um, but we also see just a lot less failure. So I, I don't think it's, I think there are, there's a lot of work that we should be doing as, like, as a community to, to train more privacy engineers. I have people coming to me all the time asking to hire privacy engineers. And there are very, very few of us out there. But it is also entirely possible to work and try to teach people to think about this respect concept. Um, so you, you mentioned that uh, sometimes the trade-offs, uh, or, or what is, the most, um, what assures the best privacy is the most obvious that there are trade offs, like for the example with spam filters. Um, when you identify those kinds of trade offs, um, like you know, default privacy settings, that kind of thing, how do you sort of go about um, weighing the, the costs and benefits to different options? The question is uh, once you identify that there is a, a trade off between different, between different human goods, how do you go? about weighing those different options. Um, so I can't do the entire field of ethics really fast, sadly. 
but there, like there, there is an entire field built around this. In short, a lot of times what we do is we is we try to think about about we try to think about a lot of things, but one of them is aggregate effects. And one of the reasons why I think about aggregate effects a lot is um, including things like how are people sorting themselves in buckets and how that really affects, is that one of the things that tends to be very true in software companies is people try to be very data driven. And they say, here's how many users I have, right? And here's how many users are happy. And they can ask questions like that because those are very measurable. And the questions that are not very well represented by those metrics are things like who is not using your system? Or how bad are the effects on people that have this, this, uh, this problem? And those may not be measurable, but they're really important. Uh, so I try to think about the things that are not easily measurable. Some things that are, because those ones are the ones that tend to slip people's minds. There's an like entire concept uh, that I use a lot called metric perversity, where it's like a perversity of incentive, but it's a perversity of metric. It's a metric that is constructed in such a way that it will cause you to take improper actions, actions that everybody would look at and, and say, that is just illogical. And there are a lot of places where, where you end up with, with uh, perverse metrics, in, given the ways that people try to measure things. 